So in primary feeder planning, there's a number of different things you need to be looking at. And some of these are included in this slide. You're gonna be looking at voltage drop and what's gonna be important in this case is the voltage doesn't drop below 90%, 95% of nominal. Um, there's also a requirement that it doesn't exceed 105%, and so you just can't boost voltage arbitrarily. So we'll spend a lot of time on voltage drop this semester. You, you're always also concerned about not exceeding thermal and passivity limits for pieces of equipment. So this is at the top of the feeder, obviously, where you're looking at circuit breaker currents and top of feeder line segment loadings. Um, also, you're looking at to make sure you're not overloading transformers on the circuit. You need to make sure that you can coordinate various protection devices on your circuit. We'll talk about a little bit later this semester what's involved for protection coordination. But you need to make sure that you've got uh, fault current levels within certain ranges where you can coordinate protection. And then also you want to make sure that you can ensure reliability. And a lot of times this is going to mean having the ability of transferring load from one section of a circuit to another feeder, or maybe another substation. Now, as far as doing the analysis, we have computer aided tools for doing all of this. And so there's going to be tools uh, like SIME, SIME DIST and, and Millsoft Windmill, et cetera that utilize power flow algorithms and short circuit calculations to come up with the, the numbers that we need. Um, but there's also approaches where you want to do a more simplified, I would say, a, a linearized type of analysis uh, just to kind of get approximations on, on what these various numbers are going to be. And where you want to use that is either in situations where you don't really have enough data to complete a computer model or you don't really need the accuracy, that the, the input numbers are so uncertain that you don't need that much precision in the computations. And so we'll talk in this lecture segment a little bit about these K-factor calculations for doing that. But mostly this semester, we're gonna be concentrating on one and two, uh, how to do voltage drop and also how to do thermal and passing limit calculations. So as far as, the modeling software that gets used, we'll spend some time on two different programs in this lecture sequence. Uh, we'll be looking at examples in a tool uh, called Millsoft Windmill, and then we'll also be using another tool, which is EPRI's OpenDSS. And so these are all going to have tools that are going to have a graphic user interface where you can draw out the distribution circuit and put in all the line and load elements and it supports doing all the different sort of calculations, say like bullish drop. But if you don't really have detail to, to be used in making a model, you know, then what would be the way forward? And, and for that, we can do more simplified linearized analysis, such as using the K factors, which I'm going to be getting into soon. So an example of where you would maybe use more simplified analysis if you're looking at new construction, um, you basically in this scenario have a sub transmission circuit and you have areas that are being built up. They don't have existing service now, but you're looking at long term load growth and the fact that there's going to be residential, commercial, and industrial loads are going to be built up in an undeveloped area. And so along the sub transmission, you have a couple different areas area number one and area number two. And so you need to figure out, well, where do the substations go? Um, if you're putting in the substations and how many feeders you're going to have and how are you going to route these feeders within these given areas, you would need to know what type of feeder voltage to use. Uh, you've got to figure out, well, what are going to be these feeder ampacities in terms of current ratings they need to, that need to be supported. Do you need to be able to backfeed? So if you have load in here, do this, does this load need to be served uh, from either substation? Um, and then you basically got to have some way of calculating what the, what the net load is going to be in each area just based on information about possible land use, right? And so you're going to want to be able to figure out how you're going to put these 
substations in and, and set up a, a feeder infrastructure so you don't have issues, say, like with voltage drop and impassy limits and things like that. So for doing things like this, when you're looking at newly developed areas, you don't even have any load out there. And so basically what you need to do is you need to know at least something about, well, whether this is going to be residential load or whether this is going to be commercial load. And utilities have certain indices about what would be the amount of KVA load per square mile that they could use for starting to build models. And so you may be starting with something as rough as just a, um, a low density per square mile, and you've got to work from there as far as trying to figure out how to do your analysis. And so anyway, this is from an old um, Westinghouse design manual. If you had this square area that you needed to supply service to, then you would maybe start by putting a substation sort of in the middle right here and breaking up into four different areas. In this case, they kind of look triangular shaped. And then you're going to have a main feeder coming out of the substation. And then off this main feeder, you'd have these different laterals where you're assuming that this load is going to be uniformly distributed. That's one way of doing this. Uh, another sort of topology would be you could maybe assume that instead of having this linearly increasing load along the feeder, that's it's more uniformly type of distributed. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. And so anyway, you have to make these sort of assumptions in terms of how feeders are going to be spaced and you know what would be the the way the laterals would be connected and things like that and i'll show you in the example section how we could use this type of assumption here at least to get started and and how we do our initial sort of design so if we don't really have detailed information to start with or we just need a simplified type of analysis is, is there a way we can actually move forward without doing these really um, computationally intense power flows? And one way of doing this is using what's sometimes referred to as the K-factor approach. That's one name for this. But basically, this is a linearization uh, where we make certain assumptions about the nature of the voltage drop to come up with simplified ways of doing voltage drop calculations. And for this K-factor approach, what we do is we calculate a percent voltage drop uh, across a system where this is going to be a function of the K-factor multiplied by the net load KVA multiplied by an equivalent line length. And so actually, once you have a given K-factor and you have an equivalent load, the longer the line, basically, the more voltage drop you're going to have. And we're going to assume it's linearly related. If we were going to double load, we double the voltage drop, right? And so this K factor turns out to be it's a function of the line impedance. It's a function of the load power factor. And it's a function of the voltage level that we're working at. And the way we do this is normally this is going to be S3 phase. So we're going to be assuming the load's going to be balanced. And so if the substation voltage is at 1.05 per unit or 105%, then what we're going to want to do is we're going to try to build a system where we make sure that voltage drop net stays under 10% and going from the top of the sub top of the feeder all the way down to the customer. And what's neat about the K factor is since this is a linear calculation, that we can superimpose results. And so, for example, if we want to calculate the percent voltage drop to a customer, we can superimpose the drop we have on the main feeder with the drop we would have on a lateral and simply sum those together to get the net voltage drop. So the K factor is based on this type of equivalent feeder model. The feeder has a resistance and reactance if we're doing phasor calculations, this is going to have a J in front of it. And there's a sending in and there's a receiving in voltage. And at the end of the line segment, we have a net load. And from this load, we can calculate the current. And so if you want to calculate this line current using a per phase calculation, 
we basically take the single phase complex power, we take the complex conjugate, we divide by the complex conjugate of the line's neutral voltage, and this gives us the complex line current. And if we manipulate this expression right here, we actually do the complex uh, conjugate operations. We see that this line current is going to have a real part and an imaginary part. The real part is SR times cosine theta divided by VR. The imaginary part is um, SR times minus sine theta divided by VR, where theta is the power factor angle of the load. And so if we have a load power factor, we can get our value of theta from that. Now, if I'm doing a voltage drop calculation, the sending end voltage is the receiving end voltage plus the drop across the line. The drop across the line is a line impedance times the current. And so basically this is in this form right here, um, an exact expression so far for, for the voltage drop. Now, the problem with this calculation is right now, the way it's set up is this is a, a nonlinear calculation, right? So we have to figure out a way of linearizing this. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take this equation and we're going to break this into, into multiple parts. We're going to use the Euler identity to take this one at angle delta, convert that to cosine delta plus J sine delta. Okay, so the delta is the angle at the sending end bus. And so we'll have the magnitude of the voltage times this complex number. We'll assume the receiving end voltage is, is the zero degree reference. So there's just the real part to this. And when we substitute in for the impedance times the current, then you'll notice in here that we get real parts and we get imaginary parts. Now, in distribution systems, typically what we find is that the angular change in voltage is small. And so if delta is small, sine of a small number, say if it's in a couple degrees, is essentially equal to zero. And the cosine of a small number, say it's less than a couple degrees, um, it's going to be about one. And so we can make the approximation that this real part is just simply going to be Vs, and this imaginary part's just going to be zero. And so we have the sending end voltage magnitude is the receiving end voltage plus the drop across the line. And if the imaginary part on the left-hand side of this equality is zero, that means this particular term is going to be essentially zero as well. And so the, the line voltage drop is going to be the receiving end KVA load times the total line resistance times cosine theta, which is the power factor, plus SR X times sine theta, all divided by V sub R. And so the voltage drop, if we put both Vs and Vr um, together now, uh, the voltage drop is going to be Vs minus Vr, which is going to be this expression right here. Again, this is um, based on the fact that delta is small, but it's still nonlinear because I've got the form of the voltage in the denominator. So I do um, a couple other manipulations here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break, I'm going to calculate R as a function of the line length S, or the, let's call that equivalent line length S. Small R and small, small X are the equivalent resistance and the equivalent reactance in terms of usually it's like um, per mile, something like that, or it could be per kilometer. And then what I'm going to have for SR, which is the single phase load, is I'm going to take the three phase load, divide by three, and multiply this by a thousand if I want S3 phase to have the units of KVA. That's typically a good number to use for distribution level calculations.
And so when we do this, when we break the net resistance and reactance into a line length times an equivalent resistance and reactance per unit length, then this voltage drop is going to be this equivalent line length times the quantity of R cosine theta plus X sine theta over VR times 1000 over three times S three phase. And then if we want to normalize and do this in terms of a percent voltage drop, then what we can do is we can normalize by the nominal voltage of the line. That's what V rated is in this case. And remember, this has to be aligned to neutral value. And then we multiply this by 100%. And this actually gives us a number in terms of a percent voltage drop. Note that if I didn't have this 100% here, that basically if I divide through by the rate of voltage, that would give us a per unit value. Now, finally, in order to linearize this, the, the final step we need is we can't have that value of VR in the denominator because it's not going to be linear. So what we do is we assume that VR is going to be the same as V rated. And so a lot of people have, you know, it makes us uncomfortable. But keep in mind that what we're doing is that we're keeping V rated, I'm sorry, sorry, we're keeping VR generally between 105 and 95%, right? And a lot of times it's, it's going to be pretty close to 100%, right? So usually that value of VR, due to the fact we're trying to come up with a high quality distribution circuit, is going to be pretty close to V rated. And so if we make this final substitution, that VR could be um, assumed to be V rated, what we can do is we can linearize around that. And what this gives us is an expression for voltage drop, which is a, a linear relationship to the load, where in the denominator we now have V rated squared. And so then we could break this into an S term, which is our equivalent line length, a uh, K term, which is a function of the line impedance, is a function of the power factor angle, it's a function of voltage in our net load S3 phase. And so this K term now is given by this particular expression here, and it has units of percent voltage drop per kVA mile. And so what this is indication of is if if I load the circuit up, then by how much do I see that voltage drop change as, as S increases? Now, if I have this simple case where I just simply have all the load at the end of the feeder, this is what's referred to as a, a spot load situation. And we'll talk about this in examples later on, you know, what's a spot load. But there's a lot of cases where we have a line, we don't have all the load right at the end of the line. It's actually broken down along the entire line length. And a lot of times what we do is we make what's called a uniformly distributed load assumption, where I take that load and I just simply break it up into smaller loads that are just simply distributed up and down the length of that line. And that's what's referred to as a uniformly distributed load. And it turns out in that particular case, if you're doing the voltage drop calculation, we won't get as much line voltage drop because the load spread out evenly instead of all being at the end of the feeder. And so in that case, this equivalent value for S is going to be the line length divided by two. There's another case which I'm not going to do the proof for is if we have a linearly increasing load, like the case for that example I showed you for that substation planning problem where I'm, I'm serving kind of like a triangular shaped area. In that case, that uh, effective line length is going to be two thirds times the, the actual line length. So as far as this uniformly distributed load modeling, I'm, I'm not going to expect you guys to be able to do the proof on this. But basically, the way the proof on this works is if you have a lot of smaller load segments, let's suppose you have n load segments. If you have a, a, a net current at the top of this feeder, what you would do is you would break that into small load segments where each current is I divided by N. 
And so if you wanted to calculate this net voltage drop, you could actually go through and you can apply some mathematics to this. And what you find out is this net voltage drop is going to be given by the um, net line length. Um, I'm sorry, not, not, not the net line length, but the, the, the line impedance um, per unit length times the length of the line times I times the quantity one plus one over N divided by two. Okay, so Z is the, the, the impedance per um, line length and L is the total length in this case. And as N goes to infinity, then basically what you would see is this voltage drop is this line impedance per unit length times the length times I over two. So one way of thinking of, another way of thinking about this is if I had a, a spot load, you know, I could have all the load at the end, but if I have uniformly distributed load for the sake of doing a voltage drop calculation, basically I have half the load at the sending end, I've got half the load at the receiving end. That's another way of thinking about that. And so we'll we'll see a bunch of work problems later on during the class during this course. We'll 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 make use of this. So anyway, let's go ahead and stop here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a couple work problem examples to show you how we can make use of this K factor for doing calculations. <laughs>